Welcome back to Lesson 3, Unit 9, Kinetics and Equilibrium. We are talking about chemical equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principles. Le Chatelier. So we're going to talk about reversible reactions, upsetting an equilibrium, Le Chatelier principle, and the practice problems for that. Alrighty. So let's look at this diagram. On the left, we're noticing we have a beaker, maybe water in it, and it's going to be an open system. And on the right, we have the exact same size beaker with water, but now we have a lid on top. Do you notice anything that's occurring? I'm noticing on the open system that there's less water than the closed system. Why do you think that is? Well, looking at the arrows, one saying condensation and one saying evaporation, it looks like there's more evaporation going on than condensation. So we're noticing that the rate of evaporation in our open system is more than the rate of condensation. This is not reversible because where is all that water going to? That water is leaving and going out into the universe as water vapor. Right. That means the mass of the water is being lost to the universe. So that's an open system. We can't get that stuff back. Now in the closed system, you see that the arrows are identical. Those identical arrows are saying that the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are identical. And because there's a closed lid, that means nothing can evaporate out. Therefore, the mass of the water stays constant. So if you have a bottle of water next to you and you have the lid on it, just know that is a closed system and the amount of water vapor is always going to be the same because all that water is going to turn to water vapor. The water vapor will then turn back into water. Are you telling me that my water right now, I'm losing some of it to the universe? Absolutely. It's evaporating. You should put the cap on, otherwise you might lose some. I'm going to do that right now. Excellent. You might, like, save a couple, I don't know, microliters? Yep. Microliters. Okay, it's capped. Excellent. Closed system. Closed system. So, again, looking at the picture to the left, this is, again, a closed system. Everything we're doing with Le Chatelier's principle is closed. Nothing leaves and nothing comes in without us putting it in. Right. And equilibrium can only happen in closed systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's an example of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas producing water. And during that process, it actually produces an enormous amount of heat and energy. But if we were to think about it in the closed system mentality, we can also say that water with the heat that was just generated could then turn around and make our reactants the original hydrogen and oxygen gas. Right. Since nothing is lost to the universe, then it's going to just stay in that container. Which is what we call a reversible chemical reaction. Correct. So a reversible reaction is one in which the conversion of reactants to products and the conversion of products to reactants occurs at the same time. I like that simultaneous thing. Simultaneously. Mm -hmm. That is an SAT word. Yeah, so when the rates of the forward and the reverse reaction are equal, the reaction has reached a state of balance called chemical equilibrium. There's that word, equilibrium again. Mm -hmm. If we had to break that word down, what's one word we can say out of equilibrium? Equal. I was going to go with brain. Oh. Brium. Brium. I, I think equal is better. But the relative concentrations of the reactants and products at equilibrium constitute what we call the equilibrium position of a reaction. So it doesn't actually mean that they have to be equal, it's just that they stay constant. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean when you do these reactions that you use everything. Sometimes when you look at your graphs or any documents that are given to you, you'll notice, for example, in the bottom left graph, that we never actually decrease the amount of reactants. It never reaches zero. It reaches some amount, but it never goes to completion. It never says, we use everything and it's done. Yeah, it looks like that bottom chart, that bottom to the left, uh, the reactants were used to make some products, but because it was in a closed system, over time, the products built up and built up, and now they started to make more reactants, eventually reaching an equilibrium. So thinking about equilibrium, don't forget that if we increase the pressure, concentration, and temperature, Equilibrium can occur either at a faster or slower rate, depending on the increase or decrease of those variables. And depending on the amount of collisions that occur. And the rate. And the rate. 
So when we talk about altering equilibrium or shifting that balance, we're gonna be talking about stresses. So changes in concentration of a reactant or a product can cause a stress on an equilibrium, changes in temperature, and also changes in pressure can affect the equilibrium. So when we say altering equilibrium, we're talking about a shift. And we're gonna be using the word shift often. So I highly do recommend that you write down shift and the following next two words shift. somewhere into your reference table. So if we were to shift right, that means the reaction is going to make more products at equilibrium. And if we shift left, we're going to be making more reactants, doing a reverse reaction. Whenever we do shift right, shift. <laughs> we're going to say that the forward reaction is favored. And when we shift, shift left, we're going to say that the reverse reaction is favored. It's all about the shifts. Shifting. Shift. Stick shift. <laughs> so the entire idea behind the shift and the stresses at equilibrium comes from a French chemist going by the last name of... Le Chatelier. <laughs> Le Chatelier. He's a pretty suave looking dude with those... I like the monocle. Is it a monocle? Oh, monocle? No, it's not a monocle. Not a monocle. Yeah. Imagine I had those. <laughs> Pretty weird. My hair's a little too long. So with the Shatlier's principle, the idea is if a stress, again, a change in temperature, pressure, or concentration is applied to a system at its equilibrium, the reaction will either make more products or reactants to relieve that change in the stress. And the word dynamic equilibrium just refers to that if we affect any part of that equilibrium, it will always eventually go back to equilibrium. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Concentration changes will cause a shift in either direction depending on what's happening. So if we increase our reactants, there's going to be more reactants to make more products. More so products, then there's going to be a shift towards the right. And shifting right means making more products. If we were to decrease our reactants to get rid of our starting materials, our products would have to break themselves apart and make more reactants, which is what we call shifting to the left. If we increase our products, more products available to make collisions, creating new reactants. So there's going to be a shift to the left and then a decrease in products would cause there to be more reactants available to make more products, and now there's going to be a shift to the right. You have to think about Le Chatelier's principle almost as a seesaw. If you're using a seesaw idea where the arrows are, that is to represent the middle of the seesaw. If you're increasing the left-hand side, then the right-hand side has to increase as well to balance out that additional weight. So when we look at Le Chatelier's principle in concentrations, we're noticing on the graph to the left that we're taking H2 and N2, and they're being combined together to make NH3. We're noticing at first we have initial equilibrium, which is the graph section to the left, but then we're noticing that we're, we have a sudden spike in hydrogen gas. That sudden spike in hydrogen gas shows that we're increasing the concentration of hydrogen. That is the stress we are adding to our equilibrium reaction. So that stress then causes an increase of products, NH3, but it causes a decrease in reactants. So adding more of one reactant causes a decrease in the other reactant, but ultimately makes more products. And again, notice that there's an equilibrium reestablished. This is what we call dynamic equilibrium. So every time we change a value, an increase or decrease in concentration, the system will go back to what we call equilibrium. So temperature changes will also affect a shift. If we're looking at an endothermic reaction, like the one that is on our screen, you will see that if there's an increase in temperature, then there's going to be a shift towards the right. When we talk about temperature, think of it as a unit, just like if we're increasing the concentration. If you're increasing temperature, that means you're applying more heat to the left-hand side. Right, and it's also considered almost like a reactant itself. And then if we decrease the temperature, it's 
like we're saying, we're decreasing one of those reactants. So there's going to be a shift to the left. Do you think that endothermic and exothermic reactions have the same effect? I'm going to say no. Huh. I feel like they're going to be opposites. Probably. Let's check it out. So here we have an exothermic reaction. We have N2 plus H2 making two moles of NH3. Before we give you the information on this, take a, you know, take a look at this. Determine what you think will happen if there's an increase in heat or increase in temperature. Hopefully you said there's going to be a shift to the left because there's more heat, more products, and now we're going towards the reactants. And if we were to decrease that temperature in an exothermic reaction, then we would notice that we're shifting to the right, thus we are making more products. Again, if you think about it, the analogy from last time, from our last video, we talked about using glow sticks. When you put glow sticks in different temperature water, from room temperature to cold to hot, the rate of the reaction is going to increase or decrease. So by changing the temperature, we're either getting more product or if we decrease the temperature, we're going back and getting more of our initial reactants. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see nitrogen dioxide and, nit and dinitrogen tetraoxide. If you put both of these in a container together and they're in a closed system, nitrogen dioxide will produce dinitrogen tetraoxide um, and vice versa. It's an it's a equilibrium reaction. And most of the times when you actually do a real chemistry, you're never actually making these little diagrams of circles and squares. Instead, you're just looking at color changes. So finally, we're going to be talking about what happens when we affect pressure. And pressure only affects gases because gases are the only ones compressible. Solids are not compressible. You can't squeeze stone into a smaller space. You can't squeeze liquids into a smaller space. But you can squeeze gases into smaller spaces. So if we were to, by chance, increase the pressure, the reaction is going to shift to the side that has less amount of moles. If you look up top at our formula, the reactants have four moles and our products only have two. So in this situation, we would be shifting to the right. If you were to decrease the pressure, the reaction shifts to the side with the greater amount of moles. Less pressure, more space, more room for all those extra moles. So if you decrease the pressure, you're going to be shifting in this situation to the left. And remember, you're only counting moles of gases. Not no solids. Li no liquids and no aqueous substances. So again, just looking at this little diagram, on the left-hand side, starting at A, we have a piston. We have some gases on the inside of nitrogen and hydrogen. And as we're applying pressure, again, this is Boyle's law, as pressure and volume are indirect. Pressure increase, volume decreases. We're noticing then that those starting reactants or reagents are then making products like NH3 on the far right hand side. So right now we want you guys to try this question. This question is what we call the Haber process, which is, was created by Fritz Haber, who was a German chemist, and it makes ammonia. And that ammonia is very, very, very useful in fertilizers for agricultural businesses. So right now, we want you guys to look at the screen, but pause the video, and in your notes, we want you to identify what direction the shift will go. Will the shift go to the right? Will the shift go to the left? Again, going to the right, it's going to make more products. Going to the left, it's going to make more reactants. All right, so looking at this, if we were to add more reactants like nitrogen or hydrogen, we should have a shift to the right. Shift to the right. <laughs> so by adding more reactants, we are going to be making more products. Now, if we add more products, we're going to shift to the left, thus making more reactants. Before we move on to the next one, just remember that if we added more nitrogen, then the hydrogen, in order to make more ammonia, is going to decrease as well. How about if we remove nitrogen or hydrogen, so any of the reactants? Well, would, it, would that also go to the left? Why? I'm not too sure. <laughs> well, it's going to go to the left because you're going to decompose that NH3 into nitrogen and hydrogen. Less 
reactants makes the equilibrium want to make more reactants. Oh, that's that's what equilibrium means. Yep. Gotcha. And how about if we remove some of that product, some of that NH3? So if we have less products, does that mean that our reactants have to make products? Yep, it so, does. So that means we have to shift to the right? Correct. Oh, and we're synthesizing. Remember those words, decomposition, synthesis? I remember. Ooh. I hope they remember it. <laughs> I hope so, too. Yeah. All right. So what happens, though, if we add heat? And thinking about heat as like a unit, like a reactant or a product. So it looks like heat is a product over here. So if we're adding products, products are going to want to make more reactants then. So I'm going to say shift to the left. Huh. Wow, look at that. So in this situation, if you take that NH3 and apply more heat to it, it's going to break apart making those reactants. So what happens if we get rid of that heat then? So again, thinking of heat as a product, if we lower the amount of products we have, I believe it's going to shift to the right. So that shifting to the right, as we say, basically those gases are, because they're getting colder, coming together? Yes, it's going to make them get closer, more collisions, more and, products. Oh, okay. And eventually they'll synthesize and make your product. Mm -hmm. But now, what happens if we increase the pressure? I don't see anything in this formula about pressure. Yeah, so again, pressure, we have to look at the moles of gas. So it looks like the reactants have four moles of gas, while the products have two moles of gas. So if you increase pressure, it's going to affect the side that has the most moles of gas. So you're going to want to get away from that. So you're going to go towards the right. So we're shifting to the right. So mm -hmm. compression will actually make more products. Because mm -hmm, you're pushing them closer together, pushing them closer together, make them collide, and make product. And if we decrease the pressure, which means we increase the volume, so more space, more space, then we should be shifting then back to the left. So the expansion will actually create more of our starting reactants. Shift. Alrighty then. Shift. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Again, guys, don't forget that this is all about closed systems. This, for example, is the desktop model of what the Haber process was done in. Notice that nothing can go in, nothing can come out. Everything's in tubes and cylinders. Once you open that system, it's equilibrium's over. gone. All right, so stuff you should have learned, guys. Stuff on closed systems, reversible reactions, chemical equilibrium, stresses to equilibrium, how we'd make shifts in the equilibrium, and the entire idea behind Le Chatelier's principle. Shift. Shift. Oh, one last thing, a little shout out. We really want to thank... John Cena!